The Hard Truth with Akusia Konedu. Proudly brought to you by Echo Bank. Welcome to season 10 of The Hard True Now. Tonight, with euphoria gradually heating up in this election year, the question of security crops up again. Election violence and security has always been an issue in Ghana, and with reports of weapons cash uh, being found in clashes in volatile areas of this country, the safety of the politicians and electorate must be a serious concern uh, for the security agencies. Tonight, we delve into these issues with Dr. Imano Kusienin. Uh, he's a security analyst and director of the Faculty of Academic Affairs and Research at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center here in Accra. My name is Nana Akosia Kunedu, and this is season 10 of The Hard Truth, and we are proudly brought to you by Echo Bank, the Pan African Bank. Dr. Inin, welcome to The Hard Truth. Thank you. According to you, um, a major survey of 10,000 people uh, in Ghana shows that uh, for about above 18 people, there are about 2.3 million uh, people who own small arms in the country, representing about 39% in uh, the northern region, 16% in the Ashanti region. It goes on and on now. How serious a problem are small arms uh, proliferation and its trade uh, in Ghana? Well, I think it's been a problem for a very long time. Um, as a nation, we haven't taken it seriously. Um, and I think it's, it may come to haunt us mm. in the long term. Mm. Whilst the 2004 study survey dealt with only four or five of the regions, the 2015 survey dealt with all the regions in Ghana. So the responses are much more, uh, much more realistic, I would say. Mm. No, but you again 10,000 people you know and uh, 2.3 million can I say there are more arms but they just got to know about 2.3 million I think 2.3 million for a 24 million population is it's a lot yes now I'm lot. asking do do we anticipate that there, there could be more than 2.3 million oh, definitely. Arms? oh definitely yes mm. because we are not taking into consideration the ones that are still being manufactured um, the 2.3 let me probably take a step back the 2.3 million is calculated on the basis that there's an attrition rate of about 20 percent over time so if we take 20 percent of 2.3 million that then brings it down but then we know that because the regulations governing small arms manufacturing sale in this country um, are basically sort of outdated but Kose, do you think that our security agencies have control over the situation in ghana in terms of blacksmith fabricators and importers, do you no. think they have a control no. over? No, that they don't have a control mm. because there's a certain traditional um, set of rules around it that makes it almost impossible, you know, for somebody who is not trusted to find out where they are, who they are, how they sell their arms, how they. they what what can be arms. done about it? So if we don't know, is it like it? Is it fine? Because when you go elsewhere. You buy an arm, you, it, it's, it's, it's in the system, this person owns it. What, what can be done with this? Well, I think, you know, for the past three weeks or so, I've been talking a bit about the field of institutional mechanisms and processes. I mean, Ghana is part of the Economic Committee of West African States Small Arms Convention. Right. And the convention does two things that I think is, I find very fascinating. One is to enjoin member states, for, for example, Ghana, to engage in a dialogue with the manufacturers, which we haven't done because we're still criminals. Why is that? Do. Well, I guess it's, one is signing the documents in Abuja and whining and dining and dancing. The second is bringing the document back home to say, look, this is what we have signed mm. and we need to implement it. Mm. The second thing that the uh, convention does is to recognize the, the, the cultural dynamics underpinning small arms possession, and that is why it appeals I think proactively for some dialogic uh, processes between the state and those who manufacture. What of laws? Do you think we have some stringent laws to discourage the fabrication of trade in small arms? Because you stated previously uh, that blacksmiths in Ghana have the capacity to produce about 200,000 arms annually and uh, being adequately enforced by security agencies. No, I think the law is really not realistic. I mean, it's old, it's scattered all over the place. 
I think in the last 10 years, there have been about two efforts, attempts to get all the laws, you know, collated and made into a single law. Mm. That, that has failed. And I think because of that failure, uh, the interior minister is the, only, the sole person in this country who can give permission for people to repair guns or to manufacture. Mm. To date, I don't know if any case in which somebody has been given the opportunity legally to manufacture. So we need to look at the legislation once more. But hopefully, Mr. Prosper Bandi will be passed and uh, we can engage in a conversation because he's a small arms expert. And the work that we've done right now at the Kofi Annan Peacekeeping Training Center, he actually established that project uh, several years ago when he was with the Bureau for Conflict Prevention and, Re uh, and Reconstruction. So I'm looking forward to his being appointed and uh, having a conversation with you, him. You realize, sir, that uh, many commentators have expressed worry on the developing lawlessness and violent behavior in the Ghanaian youth, particularly in the election year, I mean, this year. Now, they are constantly uh, used as tools to, to uh, create troubles in this year. Some believe that unemployed youth can be easily exploited, you know, within this, this period. But as society, how can we manage the situation to prevent the rise? Probably we need to take a couple of steps back. Um, first is that the physiology, youth unemployment, let me also be very, very frank. They are unemployable. The second... Unemployable? Yeah, because the educational background is terrible and bad. I mean, I don't think we are training and educating people who can respond to the needs of industry. Do, do, I, I, I don't know, but does it matter? I mean, I, I yeah. don't have a good education, yes, does but does matter. that so matter? What of skills? What of some training or yeah. some, you know, areas that they could be employed in? Well, what skills? Um, we need to give them skills. Mm. But I think we haven't crossed that bridge that says, look, if we all can have formal education, what kinds of skills, practical skills, can we give young people that allows them, you know, to be employable? Mm. Unfortunately, we haven't done that. So we are sort of the few technical schools that are there. Well, most of us are having very formal education, reading and writing a bit of mathematics, and then uh, that's just it. But I think we need to separate what you term as the as the indiscipline away from the elections because I think some of the things that we are seeing from say October last year right. until now I think I could say that they are deliberate that deliberate. somebody may be manipulating it but the timing is crucial because it allows all of us to say oh election 2016 is important and it's crucial and sensitive and therefore all these things happening are because of election 2016 mm. That then forces us to divert attention from the real issues leading to these insecurities and to focus on the election. That allows possibly the insidious hand that is, that is controlling or manipulating these, these cases you know, to continue. Let me try to give a few examples as Please to why do. I raise this issue. The arms caches that we've been seizing this year those arms caches haven't come in from anywhere and they are going nowhere. I think those arms caches, we need to look back to the arms that were brought into this country by Mr. Gaddafi at the beginning of our own revolution and then discriminately distributed without any marking, without any stockpile management processes. Other people, as the trucks pass through villages, pick these guns and hit them. And I think some of those guns are now beginning to come out. We're also beginning to see... So you're saying we've had them all this while well in the system? We've had them all this while well in the system. But if you see the quality and the, for lack of an appropriate word, the heaviness of the guns that we are seeing... So scary. It's scary. Now, the guns that were found in Kumasi, I think that was an surface to air missile or something of that sort that could shoot down planes. Now, this is a dramatic thing. Uh, three weeks ago, when the Bumprugu crisis was ongoing, hmm. most of the people who were interviewed complained about that they hadn't, quote, heard the sound of such a gun before. It's heavy, sustained, automatic. Now, we see rising tensions between religious groups or amongst religious groups in this country, and that is way surprising. But one of the things that identified us as a nation was our was our tolerance and our ability to have in the same family Christians, Muslims, animists or atheists or whatever we call them 
and we all enjoyed each other's ceremonies and festivals and whatever you you call it. But in the last couple of the last eighteen months or so, we are seeing seemingly innocent triggers leading to tensions, of which the last one was the Chafu case. So all these things are leading people to say, "Wow, these are election-related violence." My argument is no, that we've got to split these seemingly innocent, but from where I sit, increasingly linked acts of violence away from election 2016. So I, 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 I'm really scared. Not I don't know whether I'm scared or I'm confused. So, yeah. so what is it? So we, we, we got few guns from, from Tafu and Kumasi, and I'm, I'm sure some parts of our flower, you know, the guns were there. Do we have more? Do we have more? No, because we have more. I mean, where are these 2.3 million? I mean, according to the Ghana Police Service Firearms Bureau Register, but those were small arms. I mean, I mean these very um, scary arms, you know, that, that were discovered in Kumasi and yeah. Atafalao. Do we still have? I those think we guns? have considerably more, because if you talk to the people who are conversant with the convoys that came from Libya and the type of arms that were in those convoys, mm. those were not small fry arms. Those were heavy guns, mm. and we can see subsequently when Mr. Gaddafi will. We'll be right back. The Hard Truth with Akosia Konedu. Proudly brought to you by Echo Bank. At Echo Bank, we see a great future. One that's full of opportunity. For those who want to be the best. With over 1,000 branches of a single bank across 33 African countries. It's a future where trade can flourish without boundaries. The future is breathtaking. With enormous cross-border investments helping business and government build new infrastructure. While individuals achieve their ambitions right across Africa. The future is Pan-African, and Echo Bank is the Pan-African Bank. Welcome back to The Hard Truth, and it's season 10, the very first episode, and we are proudly brought to you by Echo Bank, the Pan-African Bank. Dr. Emmanuel Kosi, and in the security aspect, is still here. Now, sir, you commented that uh, the recent uh, mistakes of killing of innocent individuals by the police in Mampong and have suggested partnership between communities and uh, agencies to assist. Now, the, these recent uh, mistaken police shootings alongside uh, some efforts by the security forces identify, you know, some among the civilians and uh, who may feel threatened by the police. So if the police starts coming, I'm like, mm. I'm so scared. What fears or what can be done to, to care these ones? Well, I think, let me say this. I think the Mampong case was totally tragic. Um, I truly do sympathize with, with those, uh, both the families and also the police officers who undertook that. I think it's about rules of engagement. What are the rules of engagement for people who are armed, wearing official uniforms, and have to work to protect all of us? Do we have those rules of engagement? If we have them, under what conditions do they kick in? and what types of psychological support and training do we provide for those who are facing danger, the adrenaline is pumping, and they have to take immediate decisions mm. about life and death. But unfortunately, it looks to me as if those rules of engagement are not in place, or at best if they are, the officers on duty can decide what to do uh, in terms of the full and the crisis the eastern regional commander has ordered his men you know to shoot the full and the cattle in case they are used to attack his men now that raises some very serious concerns because under what conditions will a grown person deliberately push his means of livelihood to be destroyed okay now I've been trying to find out, and I've asked some other journalists to try to find out what the rules of engagement are. 
because by telling your men to do this kind of action, mm -hmm. you, are you, are, you are not even possibly exploring what can we do to ensure that somebody or a group of people are not pushed to the wall to use their own means of livelihood as a weapon of war. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that we, we need to identify what the rules are and how best to train but what people. Would that do, sir? What would the rules do? So you are chasing some guys on a motorbike. Yeah. You ask them to stop. They, they, don't, they, stop. they don't stop. Yeah. The guy, you, you say the guy took something from his back like a gun right. and you, you just shot and shot and shot at them. Rules of anger. Does it matter? Now, I, I yes, want it matters, to... Yes. It, it does? It does. Because, you see, when you are a first line responder, so let's take this motorbike case. He's moving. You think he's taking something from his back pocket. Your initial response. Okay, it might be a gun. Yeah, it might be a gun. But the rules of engagement says not to shoot him in the back, but to shoot the tire of the bottle. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That tumbles him down, mm -hmm. possibly loses the gun, and then you can then go for the leg or arm or something. So they are, they, they are, they are specific rules. Okay. But for me, my real concern is, what do we learn from this? How do we prevent other innocent lives from being lost? Because we need a more dialogic, engaged, responsible, responsive type of policing. A partnership between those of us who are protected and need the services provided by the police. And the police themselves who need the intelligence and the information that we can provide because we live in the communities. And I think because this partnership hardly exists anywhere, that is why we see seemingly innocent, non-threatening situations, you know, bubbling, 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 bubbling under the surface mm. and eventually exploding. And go, go. Under no circumstances ought to have happened. But it is consistent, persistent institutional failure over time, covered up, shunted to the side, that has led to where Agogo is. We did a survey yesterday mm -hmm. or two days ago. We were asking people, mm -hmm. people are so frightened by the police, just seeing the policemen, especially the armed ones. They yeah. are like, they are no more our friends. Sure. What could you tell people in Ghana who sees a police and like, I didn't want to talk to them because, I mean, in the, the, the least mistake that they might shoot me dead. Yeah. Please talk to them because let's not forget. Do we have badges? Do we, I mean, yes. you see them Every wearing. police officer okay. must have his name. Does it matter? Can't I go get the uniform and put my name across the and, and have that thing there? Don't we need to identify something unique about maybe a badge or something they have apart the from the name? They have the badges. So I see them like, where's your badge? And then... Yeah. I mean, I routinely, when I'm stopped at a traffic point, you know, and I travel extensively around this country, I'll stop politely. The first thing you do when you come to my car to tell you where's your identification. Mm. I can't see your name. And I can see your number. Mm -hmm. Now, when you ask them that, they suddenly do realize that you know the law. That you know the law. Mm. That you know what should happen. Mm. So I think the onus is not just on us as recipients of their services, but it's also on on that service itself. But there's an institutional culture over time that has deepened, but which I think Mr. Kudala and his team are trying to change. I mean. You see, say, the, the official spokesman. I mean, Mr. Arthur is accessible. He's friendly. You can yeah. really pick and speak to him. Uh, Ms. Tenge, the Accra spokesperson, mm -hmm. is really a I'm great person. Him. Yeah, I'm paying You know, so the service itself is making an effort to transform and to present a friendlier face. But when you have also another type of officer class, desperate to use a Rambo style, Okay, when the cattle come, gun them down. Somebody has said he doesn't like it. Who the hell is this guy? He thinks he's an expert. He sits behind his desk in Accra. Who is he? I'll challenge his qualifications. Mm -hmm. So I've asked the commander to set up a meeting in Kofodia. I'll be willing to have a public debate with him. Mm. That is, if I'm not gunned down like a dog before I get there anyway. Now, in December 2015, you yes. indicated also that considering the high stakes of uh, the uh, presidential elections, uh, the use of the macho men and then the Bulgar Bulldogs and the Zucker Boys to intimidate our, our opponents in the election here for Ghanaians. Now, 
what must political leaders do to put these personal security details in check as well and how can the groups uh, be controlled by the security agencies? Well, a couple of points of course. First is that Mr. Kudero, the IGP, has made it very clear that politically affiliated security groups are illegal. That's number one. But there seems to be some confusion of sorts. Mm. Mr. Agaga, the Deputy Interior Minister, says politically affiliated security agents or armed gangs is a no-no. I think during, during the vetting of Mr. Bani, I think he made an allusion that no, it will be looked at and probably they can be legalized. But I don't think there should be any legalization here. I think the no-no must be very clear. The police should just take over these The days. police should take over the election security task force, which I think Mr. Kudela has established. But what is politics about? Politics and joining a political party is about shared values, mm -hmm. shared norms, and shared principles. There is no political party manifesto in this country that glorifies politically motivated violence. So why the need for this? Because were you and I to contest for an election, but whilst doing that election, we claim that we don't trust the statutory security forces mandated by law to protect whoever is the head of state. Mm -hmm. So when you win, how do you disband the forces that you have established? And we know from Kosovo, from Burundi, from Rwanda, and elsewhere, from Liberia, Sierra Leone, and La Côte d'Ivoire, the difficulty of disbanding political party-affiliated security forces when they think they've helped you to come into power. They think they have a right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think Mr. Kudelo's approach is saying, look, we can get the job done. Give us the men and women, give us the tools, and we will get the job done. And I think a truly unique intervention by the police has been the establishment of what he called the political desks, by which I've consistently said should, that name should be changed from political desk to a threat assessment unit. We'll be right back. The Hard Truth with Akosia Konedu, proudly brought to you by Echo Bank. Bank, we see a great future, one that's full of opportunity for those who want to be the best. With over 1,000 branches of a single bank across 33 African countries, it's a future where trade can flourish without boundaries. The future is breathtaking with enormous cross-border investments helping business and government build new infrastructure. While individuals achieve their ambitions right across Africa. The future is Pan-African and Ecobank is the Pan-African Bank. We are back on the hard truth, and we are proudly brought to you by Echo Bank, the Pan African Bank. Emmanuel Kwesi Enin, uh, security expert, is here. Now, sir, you let's talk about the matter of um, JB Danka. You know, it's brought about uh, renewed calls for uh, personnel in the police security for for MPs and all. Now, other MPs are including Albert Kandapa, Afriya Koto, Benjamin Kumbo, and the likes have also been confronted by the Amherst. But you, however, seem to disagree with these calls. Why is that? They need to serve us first. We, as recipients of the services that they produce, must feel secure first. Of course, the alternative argument is, oh, well, they make the law, they pass the budget, so secure them first and they will secure you. But I don't think over the past 20 years of the Fourth Republic, or probably more than 20 years, they've demonstrated a care and a concern for the security and the protection of the ordinary people of Ghana. I think the broad rhetoric is that we want peace and security. Mm. But you, you've mentioned instances of individuals who have been attacked, which is most unfortunate and is extremely dangerous. But I've always been raising my voice against protecting or giving them specialized protection because on the floor of the House of the Parliament, I do not remember how many times they've spoken about the general insecurity in this country. I don't remember how often they've hauled the IGP to appear before the House 
if you read Acts 350 of 1970 that establishes the Ghana Police Service, within that act, Parliament must request the Police Council to submit an annual report of the performance of the police in terms of protecting us. I think in, under the First Republic, they've only made that request once. We know that transnational crime is threatening us in terms of narcotics, in terms of terrorism. I don't think there's ever been a debate on the floor of the House with respect. I think once, and I think the boss of NACOP did not even appear. So by dissociating their own insecurity from the broader insecurities that you and I face and saying we need protection, I would want them to put some figures on the table. What will it cost us to protect 275 people? And it's not just 275. Okay, so I'm asking, President Mahama, you know, people are saying it's, some are saying it's first term, others are saying it's second term, whatever. In your opinion, do we give him a second chance? What do you think? I think that should be an individual decision by individual Ghanaians. I think people need guidance. People need people like you to say, okay, so looking at the situation and this and that and that, I think this is it. So what would you say? We can always make an improvement. Mm. I am driven by my father's adage that if friends can fly, why can't I? Mm. Um, so I always want to see better improvement, better deliverables. Um, and I think my contribution to those better deliverables is that I myself push myself to the very edge to perform. So with all this you, you just mentioned, do you think President Mahama has done well? Four years, has he done well in your opinion? On a scale of one to ten, in which ten is the highest, mm -hmm. probably I give him about six. Thank you so much, sir, I don't, that for is talking what you to went the hard truth. <laughs> Thank you so much. Dr. Emmanuel Kwesi Enin, uh, Head of Research, Kofi Annan Kia Peacekeeping Training Center, and uh, he's a security expert there. We are so grateful for your time. My name is Nana Akosia Knedwin. Thank you so much for watching our uh, very first episode. Season 10, I'm really excited. We have more uh, interesting interviews for you, and uh, the show has been brought to you by Echo Bank, the Pan African Bank. Have a wonderful evening. Bye. The Hard Truth with Akusia Konedu, proudly brought to you by Echo Bank.